in Hawaii. Whew. Oh, what a trip. <sighs> hey folks, once again, from that secret undisclosed location, hidden somewhere deep within the bowels of downtown historic St. John's, Newfoundland, comes in the Library of Graphic Literature with me, Wallace Roy, your host. Who's going to have a cup of tea here first? Or a sip of a cup of tea? Mmm, 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 mmm. And a spin of the old comic rack, just to get us going here. Whew. Okay, folks. And of course, as usual, there was, you know, there was the Thanksgiving holiday, and then there was all kinds of high winds out here on the East Coast, and of course, once again, it delayed our comics. But they arrived today, thank God, and. You might even get a second show this week if they show up on time this week. And it's unusual, uh, it's highly unusual. This We're used to seeing these high winds and all that uh, in March and that. It's uh, And that's usually where we tend to see the most delays, but this year has been a very, very windy. Okay. Whew. Let's have another sip of tea before I get into this here. Now. Any big news this week? Oh, it, as a matter of fact, the uh, uh, my good friend Dennis Osborne, my f uh, fellow uh, Omnibody, he uh, found and sent me a little clip about the upcoming uh, uh, omnibuses that uh, Marvel will be putting out, featuring uh, all the uh, monster stories of uh, Steve Ditko. Very similar to the uh, two-volume monster bus from uh, Jack Kirby. And I knew it was going to happen sooner or later. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm assuming that sooner or later they will actually do some omnibuses of mixed stories from back then. Or I hope they do. Because there's a lot of good stories from Gene Cohn and other people too that they should uh, should reprint. Okay. That being said, let's get down to work here now. What do we got here today? Okay. we got a few. A couple of... Uh, Cup from Dark Horse. Let's start start off with our Dark Horse selections here. First of all, let's start by cutting open some plastic here. Do 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 do. Cutting some plastic without slicing my fingers off. Ah ah. I mean, without slicing my fingers off. Okay, yes. Okay. Anyway, first on today's. Uh, God damn it. First on today's uh, unwrapping here is from the fine folks at Dark Horse Comics, Dark Horse Archives presents Creepy Doo 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 This is volume 27. They're getting close to the end here. Issue 133. There's not many. I think there might only be one more in this. They had a uh, Dark Horse head. Apparently it looked like suspended this within a few books of the end of it. And of course, all of us who were collecting it went eight. <clears throat> well, you know, went went crazy, and uh, God bless Dark, Dark Horse Comics. They actually uh, listened to us out here, and they uh, they went ahead, and they're looks like they're putting out all the uh, remaining volumes. So I was a huge fan of uh, Creepy and Airy growing up. They were they were like my generation's EC Comics. Now the cool thing about Airy and Creepy and Vampirella, it's other magazine, was that because they were magazines, they were exempt from the Comics Code Authority. <laughs> so their stories were always a little bit grittier than, uh, than the common uh, comic book fair of the same uh, of the same era. So here we have artists like Alfredo Akela, uh, Richard Corbin, uh, Paul Neri, Rudy Nebrez. A lot of a lot of great artists. So uh, this is the one good thing I like like about looking at the old uh, the old eerie and creepy is looking for the different people who either ended up in comic as uh, getting into comics or this was sort of the 
and then some people who sort of left comics, I guess, <laughs> who we never seen again, but, oh yeah, this looks like, is this Rudy Nebrez? Yeah, Daniel Belandi, actually, this one here, this is the guy who actually did the uh, Captain Newfoundland. To Rich Corbin, but yeah, I mean the art. This was the, I mean the, this was some of the cutting edge stuff coming out in the '60s and '70s, I think. And I mean, creepy really, in a lot of ways, led us right into heavy metal and. And that led us into the modern age of comics. And we really got going from there. Oh, who's this there? Martin Salvador. But yeah. Like I say, that's what I love about the insert. Romeo Tangel and Alfredo Aquila. Tangel had actually inked the uh, Teen Titans, I do believe. Well, and look, an early Paul Neri. Pretty cool, eh? <laughs> but yeah so yeah any of you out there who were fans of horror horror the like uh, or science fiction check out uh, these creepy and eerie archives if you ever come across any of the magazines in your uh, hunt pick them up they're they're always a treat right highly highly worth it Whew, okay no. Mm -mm. Ah, delish. Delish, delish. Okay. Now, book number two here from you fine, fine folk at uh, Dark Horse Comics. I usually try to uh, post their, they do a weekly uh, reveal of all their books. I know if you folks have noticed lately, I've actually started posting those because it's kind of what cool to watch them live and I'll always start throwing a few comments here and there right? ah, ah, get off me get off me get off me okay here from Jeff Lemire one of the finer Canadian comic book writers out there comes oh these these are nice I black horse I like what you've been doing with a lot of your uh, super cool uh, super cool uh, Lux editions here. I guess, yeah. Now, this is a uh, best new series. This was an Eisner Award winner, best new series 2017. And uh, I know a lot of people who've actually been raving about this. So, out of all my comics that I get today, this is probably the one I'm going to crack open and, and read first. Oh, I've cracked it open. Well, I better start reading it. Do, 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 do. Uh, just let me know when you get bored. Ah, no, just joking. Um, this is a, a cool commentary on superheroes. Everyone who's read this has said to me, "Oh, you got to read this. You got to get that." So, um, and it's uh, as a matter of fact, I'll read you the thing off the back. Mysteriously banished from existence by a multiversal event, the old superheroes of Spiral City now lead simple lives on a bizarre farm from which there is no escape. Do 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 do. Kind of like primary school. It's never any escape from that. Uh, anyway, it's uh, uh, it's it's supposed to be very very good. Uh, uh, I know it was delayed because he he was actually going to draw this himself, and then he got caught up in some obligations. I think with DC, and it went back and forth. And finally, when he got back to it, he decided to go with Dino Ormston uh, f for this book. Then Dean went and had a uh, had some sort of medical issue. I think it was a hemorrhage or something like that, and that slowed it down even more. But finally, finally, it did come out in the end. And uh, you know, even just looking through it, it looks really cool. Um, a lot of times, I can tell whether a comic is good or not, even just by looking through it. If I if I can just scan through from front to back, and and I I just get this sense that. Because I can almost read the story just by looking at the pictures myself. I'm, I'm highly developed and highly evolved that way. It's 
true. Yeah. It's it's my curse, and I bear it well. So, uh, so yeah, this black hammer looks really really cool. So, as a matter of fact, mm, it deserves mm, a few kisses. It gets the kisses of the week. Anyway, here's let's have a look at oh, add some of this here. I love uh, Ormston style too. But yeah, and I do believe he even does. Uh, he filled in himself. There, someone else did some stuff. So yeah, definitely worth getting. Look at this. This looks cool. Oh no! No, no this does look like Jeff's own stuff. But uh, yeah. It's uh, I can't wait to wrap my peepers around this. I tell you that it's looking good, looking real, real good. So black hammer, get out there and get hammered. <laughs> so another wonderful book there. Like I say, great, great production values, great production values. My uh, three cheers for uh, for Dark Horse. You guys rule this week. Now, hoo -hoo -hoo. this from DC Comics comes da -da -da -da, Aquaman: The Search for Mira, do -do 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 -do, deluxe edition. Um, I read these stories as a kid. Actually, I was a I was a big fan of. Uh, and I'll open my book here. I think I might need a new blade. Um, yeah, I read these as a kid, actually. Uh, I was a huge fan of, uh, of Aquaman at the time, and uh, don't ask me why, but I was. Uh, but yeah, I loved uh, Skeets and uh, Paro's run on it. Get off, get off, get off. And especially the covers. The covers, a lot of them were done by Nick Carty, who... A lot of people today won't recognize his name, but he was, uh, he did the greatest covers for, for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the Aquamans from around that time. So, uh, like I say, I love, I mean, I, like I say, I've been a, a, uh, <coughs> a power fan for years and all that. And, uh, and it started around here because I can remember seeing some of these when I was younger. Then, of course, I got into the, uh, into the Spectre and the Batman, and, and and he just he just got better and better from there. Um, but yeah, I always loved the uh, the covers from uh, from the late uh, '60s Aquaman. They were really cool. And this one, like I say, it's it was a good story from what I can recall. It's been a while since I read this, so this goes into the reading stack. I will read this. This is actually one of the covers. Absolutely cool, all right. I will have a look inside here. Actually, I have some of the okay. Let's start here. Okay, oh, there's there's one of the covers, but yeah, always loved a uh, great artwork, too. Huge fan of, of Jim Apparel, and who isn't? Oh, there. Here's another one of those great covers. Some more great artwork from Jim. Oh, look at this. I mean, come on, people. Really? Look. Cardi did a lot of the uh, 70s. He was kind of like the Gil Kane of DC for the 70s. Look at that. I used to love his, his Superman uh, covers. Oh, 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 come on now. Oh. I mean, what? Dramatic. <laughs> oh, there you go. There's the classic one. Look at that. Classic or what, eh? Okay. Let's have one more. Oh. And now you die. <laughs> Aquaman just didn't take a guff back in those days. Come on, show me. Oh, there you go. 
look at these so yeah the, <coughs> that really was what attracted me this to me to this series when I was a kid they had great great covers especially the Detroit the monster that ate Detroit one was a great was a classic uh, but yeah oh geez that one deserves to be kissed mm. classic 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 oh last but not least Jeez, I got dust on that. Let's have a sip here. I got a bit of a stuffy nose. This week, I don't know if any of you noticed that. And from uh, Titan Comics, this week comes Emma G. Wildford by Zidru and Edith. Uh, this just looked kind of cool. I, I picked it up. Uh, it's, uh, it's about a, a letter sent to. Uh, to Emma G from her fiance Rowan, who left on an expedition to the Arctic. No one has heard from him since. I uh, know it looked kind of cool to me, so anything sort of vaguely historical these days, I'll I'll pick up. But the uh, yeah, the artwork looked kind of cool, and it was just like, wow, I got to uh, I got to give this a, a, a try. But yeah. It looks pretty cool, so uh, yeah, I would recommend it for people. Here, have a quick look through here. I love just, I love many styles of art. So because some people say to me, are you a DC or Marvel person? I'm just an all out comics person. I don't care what the comic, what the company, if it's a good comic, I'll love it. So yeah, this looks good enough anyway. Oh, sneezy, sneezy. Sneezy, wheezy, sneezy, wheezy. Whew, okay, well that's just about it for this week. Uh, except, <laughs> I left the, one of the biggest surprises until last. And this, of course, uh, for those who've been to your comic book shop this week, you've seen this week's previews, but, the cool thing about this week's previews, <laughs> and I know I've announced this before, but I thought I'd point it out just because it's so cool to, to be in the, uh, to finally make it to the previews. So, da da da! This is uh, the comic that myself, uh, that I worked on with my friend uh, Paul Tucker, written by Patrick Kindlin. Nobody's in control, number one. And then there's some. Uh, couple of sample pages there featuring my lettering on top of my my good buddy's artwork there so I have a look at it there I do pretty good lettering if I do say so myself oh, oh and there we go you'll notice that my credit reads hand lettered by Wallace Ryan as a matter of fact when I yeah, signed on to do the lettering for Paul that was my only condition that the credit had to read and lettered, and not just lettered by. I'm, uh, I'm trying to lead a small revolution back to the hand lettering of, uh, of comics. To me, uh, because I still to this day hand letter my own comics too, to me the hand lettering is the, it's like the, it really is, it's, it's the handwriting of the artist. Uh, I'm heavily influenced by Mobius's thoughts on, uh, on letterers and, uh, I believe that the lettering, like he did, is, is integral to the to the whole uh, to the whole package. Oh, so uh, run out and order order up a, a copy of uh, Nobody Is in Control for yourself, and uh, and I thank you. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Lovely tea, lovely tea there tonight. Okay. That being said. I will use Mother Box to soothe my runny nose and then maybe to transport me to the local drugstore to get some cough syrup. In the meantime, hopefully I'll be seeing you within a few days with a uh, another episode of In the Library of Graphic Literature. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much and keep on reading. See you later, folks. Ah!